Hi, my name is Ryan Langwish, and this is Ludo Lodge, a channel that focuses on creating content that helps spark growth for game designers. Recently, I was scrolling through Twitter and came across a tweet that sparked some really interesting discussion between both game designers and gamers. It read, I'm increasingly dissatisfied with co-op games taking hits in reviews for not tackling alpha gamers. When did designers become responsible for behavior around the table? Know the best way to mitigate alpha players? Hey Terry, you can't come next week. Sorted. It makes some sense. If a player's behavior is making the experience worse for the other players around the table, surely that's the player's fault and not a fault of the design. But this topic kind of stuck around in my head in the days after I read the tweet, and I finally decided I wanted to explore it more in depth in a video, with the core question really being, is it the fault of the design for allowing for alpha gaming to happen, or is that simply the fault of the players playing the game? Before we dive into that question directly, let's focus on what the alpha gamer problem really is. I think a lot of people have a mental persona, or maybe a very concrete example of someone they know, that comes to mind when they think of an alpha gamer. This persona is usually loud and opinionated and essentially dominates the decision making to the point where no one else is really having any fun. But I believe that is just one example of a result of alpha gaming, and the reality is a little broader, where alpha gaming is any time that a player is overriding other players' decisions to the point where those players feel like they have lost some of their agency in the game and aren't really making their own choices. So what are the factors that really determine whether alpha gaming surfaces in any given game session? I really think it's a combination of two factors. The first being, how much does the game design itself allow for alpha gaming? And the second being, how do the players in that particular group handle those opportunities for alpha gaming that are presented by the game? Let's take a look at the first piece, which is completely group independent. What makes a cooperative design in and of itself more prone to alpha gaming? Alpha gaming is going to happen more often when two things are true. First, on any player's turn, the variables that they're using to make their decision are known to all players. And the second being, the game allows for open communication among the players. When these two things are true, and they may be true to, to varying degrees, then all players have equal opportunity to determine what they think the right or best moves for the team might be. Whenever a move is suggested, all players have the necessary information to make a rational argument as to why they believe maybe a different move is better for the good of the team. And this as a player might put me in an interesting situation where on another player's turn, I am convinced that, you know what, this other move I think is better for the team than the move that this player is suggesting, and I must make a choice. I have to either bring that suggestion to the team, um, explain my reasoning, and, and you know maybe we end up going with this other choice, or I kind of hold back and let the active player kind of play out the turn how they see fit without that input. And this brings us to the second piece of the alpha gamer problem, which is how do the players handle the opportunities afforded by the game for alpha gaming? In other words, what do the players do when they're faced with the choice between sharing their reasoning for what they feel might be the best move versus allowing their teammates to make moves that they may believe to be suboptimal? The root of the problem in this situation is it puts the two primary goals of the gaming experience at odds. On one side, we have playing to win the game, and on the other, we have wanting the group to have the most enjoyable experience. Any given player is going to fall somewhere on this spectrum. Over here, we have the shouty, overpowering player that we talked about earlier. Whether or not they actually have come to the best conclusions, they believe that they have, and the goal is to win after all, so naturally it is in the best interest of the team to make those conclusions known and explain why other conclusions are wrong. What is really happening here, though, is you have a player that is prioritizing winning, at all costs, over the player experience. On the other hand, you have a player that does not contribute anything to the discussion on other players' turns, simply letting them make their decisions independently. 
They will let another player make what they feel is an awful decision for the team simply because they don't want any other player to feel like they're being bossed around or having their decisions made for them. This is a player that is prioritizing player experience at all costs over winning. I wouldn't be surprised if this is the owner of the game whose primary goal is for the other players to have enough fun that they will play more games with them in the future. Most people fall somewhere on the spectrum between these two. Making decisions about how they will discuss their reasoning versus allowing other players to take action even if they don't believe it's the best choice. But the important thing to realize here is that both sides of the spectrum have negative side effects on the player experience. It is very obvious that the winning first player has negative effects as they steal away other players' agency and make them wonder why they are even there. However, being in a position where you feel like you could help the team better meet their objective, but you're holding it in because you don't want to be an alpha gamer, that can also be a negative player experience. Because the design of the game is alpha gamer prone, it has put players in a position where they're trying to find a balance between two less than ideal experiences. So is allowing for alpha gaming always a bad thing? I don't think it's quite that clear cut. A design that might lead to a very negative experience with one group might actually lead to an extremely positive experience with another group for the exact same reasons. To illustrate this, I'm actually going to use a personal example with the game Ghost Stories. Ghost Stories is what I would classify as a very alpha gamer prone game. All the information is completely open to all the players, and there is freedom to discuss the team's option however the team sees fit. My favorite sessions of Ghost Stories have been with a group that is very open to discussing which options we think are best, but where one, no one person dominates the decision making. Not because they are holding back, but because everyone is on a similar level with how they are reasoning through the game's strategy. So much of the fun of the game in these situations is the open discussion as we rationalize through the different options as a team and come up with the plays that we feel are clever, effective, and oftentimes better than what any of us would have come up with individually. It is thrilling to have a 10-minute discussion that results in a creative move that salvages a hopeless situation and opens up a slim chance for us to roll the dice for the win. With that specific group, the game experience would actually be worse if the game was less prone to alpha gaming. It is exactly because the information is available to everyone and that we can discuss as a team that we have so much fun collaborating strategically. But there are some side effects to this. I have played Ghost Stories so many times with that kind of group that it's now become very difficult for me to bring it out with other groups. If I'm playing with new players, I really have to swallow my tongue and allow them to make moves that I may know to be suboptimal and not in the best interest of the team, which I am willing to do for the good of the group and the good of the play experience, but I cannot deny that I end up having a worse play experience simply because so much of what I enjoy out of cooperative games like that is the strategic discussion. As a result, I don't find myself getting it to the table much these days. Why choose a game that gives me that conflicted experience when I have other cooperative options that might mitigate it? The fact that Ghost Stories is very alpha gamer prone has essentially made it a very group dependent game in my collection. When I get that specific group, the experience is outstanding, but I can't deny that that aspect of the design keeps it from getting to the table as much as it otherwise would. In the end, as game designers, we're designing experiences, and I believe that the player experience is going to change depending on where your design lands on this alpha gamer prone spectrum. And that can certainly be amplified very negatively if you have bad players in the, in the gaming group. And in some cases, it can actually be amplified positively as evidenced by my, you know, preferred ghost stories group. But the reality is either way, the experience is going to change depending on how prone the design is to alpha gaming. It is up to you as the designer to make an informed decision about what kind of player experience you're aiming to create. Just like any other decision point in the design process, you want to understand the trade-offs, be able to weigh them, and ultimately make the decision that's going to best support your vision for the game. 
However, I do think it's important if for designers that want to make marketable games or games that can be pitched to publishers and played by lots of people to understand that in the board gaming market, highly alpha gamer prone designs tend to get knocked a bit. And it's simply because enough of the market finds that that dynamic in games affects their groups negatively for whatever reason that might be. And because the potential for alpha gaming changes so drastically based on group composition, I think it's a perfect thing for game reviewers to be including in their reviews. Now, I don't think they should necessarily be painting it as strictly bad and wrong, which I think is where some reviewers can maybe go a little bit too far. But it is a, it's very valuable information for a gamer making a purchasing decision. A lot of people simply know that those types of games don't work well with their group. It, not necessarily because they have a jerk or someone who's really inconsiderate that they shouldn't be playing with, but they've just found that that dynamic ends up not being as positive of an experience with their group as other games that they might be playing. So that's a lot of theoretical discussion of alpha gaming and how it emerges out of game designs, but let's get a little bit more practical. Suppose you're a game designer, you're working on a cooperative game, and you're wanting to reduce the potential for alpha gaming in that design. What options or strategies do you have available to you? I'm gonna give you six ones that I've seen employed by different games, complete with examples that should give you some tools to kind of think through how you might actually apply some of this knowledge to some of your designs. Number one, don't make all the variables visible to all of the players. If the active player has information that the rest of the players don't, it greatly reduces the alpha gamer's ability to determine what the correct move is to make. Perhaps I make a really suboptimal move, the other players may never even know that it was suboptimal because they don't know what information I had when I was making that decision. This may be a hand of cards that I have or some other information that's hidden from the other players. If you give each player an incomplete piece of the puzzle, the players are gonna have no choice but to collaborate to be able to put it all together. There are many examples of this to varying degrees, but one very common approach is to give each player their own hand of cards, as in Lord of the Rings the card game, Arkham Horror the card game, or Hanabi. Another example might be Codenames Duet, which actually gives each player their own key that they're looking at that gives them different information and forces them to make their decisions completely independent of the other player. Number two, restrict communication among players. Even if alpha gamers can draw informed conclusions about what decisions the team should make, they can't dictate the game if the game doesn't give them the tools to communicate those decisions to the other players. The crew restricts players to just a single communication per round and has very specific rules around what kind of information you can communicate. So even if the alpha gamer has figured out how they think the team should approach the round, they now have to decide what's the single most important information that I could communicate that will help the others kind of see my master plan or see how we should be playing this. Which besides alleviating the alpha gamer problem is actually a really interesting decision to make. Magic Maze is another game that restricts communication and that players cannot talk at all. Though comically there's a piece that you can actually take and tap in front of another player to essentially say, I want you to do something, which branches out of the fact that the game has asymmetric roles and is played in real time. Number three, increase the complexity beyond what one player is gonna reasonably process. If you give an alpha gamer enough to process in their own decision, they often will be satisfied making the best decision for themselves without being too concerned about if the other player's decisions are optimal. A great example of this is Spirit Island, which just has a lot of variables and permutations for how a player might play out the cards in their hand. And while the cards in their hand are not technically hidden information, there's just a lot to process for each player. Gloomhaven is another game that exemplifies this, and actually both games employ simultaneous turns for that decision-making phase, partly to alleviate game length, to allow all that decision-making to be happening at the same time, but it also helps with the alpha gamer problem because players are worrying about their own decisions at the same time. Number four, add time pressure. 
If players are required to make decisions quickly, on the fly, perhaps even simultaneously, it leaves little room for an alpha gamer to present their master plan of all the optimized actions that they feel all their teammates should be taking. Games like Escape, The Curse of the Temple, and Space Alert use time pressure in a way that just leaves little margin for lengthy discussion among the team. Number five, use risk-reward probabilities that don't have clear-cut answers. What's the better decision for the team to take a three out of four chance of getting five points or a one out of two chance of getting eight points? Anytime you have probabilities that have varying rewards, it's gonna make it very difficult for an alpha gamer to assemble a foolproof argument as to why this decision is the best one for the team. Eldritch Horror is an example of this where it uses dice to resolve nearly every decision and check in the game which creates this interesting puzzle of optimizing probabilities and deciding when is it the right time to take a bigger risk for that chance at the bigger reward. And as much as I held up Ghost Stories as kind of the, a poster child of an alpha gamer prone game, this is actually one area where it does alleviate it a little bit as it also uses dice to resolve many of the actions in the game. And number six, use decisions that are based on subjective criteria. Alpha gaming is very common in games that kind of boil down to a mathematical equation of options that are strictly better or worse than other options. But if the game is giving the player's subjective criteria to work with, it's very possible two players could disagree without either being able to really prove that the other is wrong because it's really in the eye of the beholder. Probably the best example of this is Mysterium, where players are getting clues in the form of surreal artwork with the ghost trying to communicate things to the other players. And it's all up for interpretation as players try to determine what was the ghost trying to communicate to us, what were they thinking, and that really leaves it open for players to contribute and discuss without one player really overriding the rest of the players. All of that said, keep in mind that many of the most popular cooperative games of all time are what I would consider very prone to alpha gaming. While I think alpha gaming is a combination of the design and how the players kind of react to that design, I think in all cases designers should be aware of the implications of alpha gaming in their design and just make conscious decisions about how they're going to approach it. Wowza. Whether you're looking at it through the lens of a designer or through the lens of a gamer, hopefully this video provided an interesting perspective. But it's just that. My perspective. I found this topic interesting, wanted to reason through it some more, and kind of drew some of my own conclusions in that process. But I have by no means solved any of it. And I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below related to it. Anything I talked about in this video or things you think I may have missed or should consider. I would love to hear more discussion. I find it very fascinating. If you enjoyed the video, consider giving it a like. Consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this. And I will see you next time.